The British royal family embodies strength, resilience and stability. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. Queen Elizabeth II has reigned for over 70 years. She has seen world wars, presidential assassinations and revolutions. Nevertheless, the royal family remains a solid example of gleaming British excellence until the crown slips. There was real fury in the palace. The queen was very upset that she wasn't told about this. Because royalty isn't always a fairy tale. Scandal, adultery and tragedy. They just want to get this resolved. Ultimately, this is a, a very sad internal yeah. family dispute. The monarchy finds itself in a moment of, of turmoil, flux and a genuine crisis because, of course, this has opened up a Pandora's box. Take a look behind the facade and uncover the truth from the monarchy's darkest days. Learn of their tales of romance and heartbreak, death and duty, and understand what really goes on behind those palace walls. I think I can very safely say, as naive as it sounds now, mm. having gone through this learning curve in the past year and a half, I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. I don't think either of us did that. We both said that, even though we yeah, knew I, that it would be. You know, I tried to, I tried, I tried to warn, I tried to warn you as much as possible. Mm. But I think both of us were in, totally surprised by the the reaction after the first five, six months of what we had to ourselves, of what actually happened from then. So I think you can, you can have as many conversations as you want and try and prepare as much as possible, but we were, we were totally un unprepared for, for what happened after that. On January the 13th, 2020, royal watchers were on the edge of their seats as Harry and Meghan entered what was infamously called a crisis meeting with Her Majesty the Queen, Prince Charles and Prince William. This was the deal or no deal moment. I mean, this is the real problem for the Queen and Prince Charles. They are dealing with this as a grandmother and as a father on the one hand, and they're also dealing with it as the protector of a ancient dynasty. And we have seen that how as protectors of the ancient dynasty, when they need to, they act brutally as they did with Prince Andrew when they removed him from public office. There may be a point that at some stage that the Queen, Charles and William believe that what Meghan and Harry are proposing is a threat to the institution of the British monarchy, then they will act. The royal family's future was hanging on the outcome of this critical talk. After several tense hours, Buckingham Palace announced with a heavy heart that arrangements had been reached for Harry and Meghan to leave royal duties behind and pursue an independent future. The monarchy finds itself in a moment of, of turmoil, flux and a genuine crisis because, of course, this has opened up a Pandora's box. There are so many wider issues at stake. The future of the monarchy, this streamlined monarchy that you keep hearing people talking about, what does that actually look like if Meghan and Harry do step down? Well, I think these decisions have all got to be made in the future. Anybody who's high profile needs protection, former prime ministers and ministers of defence uh, get security for a long period after they've left office. So I think that's something that everybody would suggest that they require to get uh, security. But these all, decisions will surely all be made in the, in the next few days. Public reaction was divided. While some wished the couple nothing but happiness and success, others felt resentment in abandoning the crown and country. The media press of it really speaks to the culture war that's happening in this country between older, the older generation is outraged by Harry and Meghan's decision and the younger generation, um, which is mostly supportive. There's no doubt that the reaction inside the palace was just as divided. On February the 19th, Buckingham Palace issued a statement confirming that the Duke and Duchess would not be returning as working members of the royal family. The crux of the matter is you can't be half royal. You can be 
uh, part of the royal machine. You can accept the privileges that go with it, but also take the restrictions and all that. And you live in, in a sort of bubble, or you can stand back. While the news, which came a little more than one year after the duo surprised royal watchers everywhere by announcing that they'd be stepping back as senior members of the royal family, wasn't entirely a surprise, it makes the separation official. I think the whole plan that Harry and Meghan have is a really problematic one because they're talking about stepping back. They're talking, their critics would argue, about having their cake and eat it. They're talking about one day representing the Queen on a foreign tour to a, a, another country, on another day, say, in North America, earning serious money with some sort of endorsement of some sort of product. The, the risk is that those two things aren't compatible. The risk is that their pursuit of money will tarnish the Windsor brand and tarnish the House of Windsor. The now free couple announced a new future of financial independence, stepping back from the royal family, but insisted they would continue to support their causes and, of course, Her Majesty the Queen. This is the last time we'll see the Duke and Duchess of Sussex with the Queen and the royal family on an engagement. And it's significant that it is at Westminster Abbey because this is where the Queen, who is dedicated to the Commonwealth, also took her oath and obligation to serve in her coronation in 1953. And it's really a sign that, you know, that sense of lifetime service is what the Queen has given. And this is an abdication by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to step away from that by their own choice. And the Queen's pointing out, you're either in or you're out. They shared plans to split their time between North America and the UK. See, there's an interest in America in the royals. Uh, it's a monarchy, that's one level of interest, but it's also a family, and this is a... I think for the first time a glimpse behind palace walls. It's felt like their farewell UK tour. Five engagements in five days, covering off the official, the causes that matter to them, and taking time to say thanks to their friends. But it is the event they'll attend here at Westminster Abbey that is the most significant since they've returned from Canada. Because when they arrive at the Commonwealth Day service, it will be the first time that we've seen them alongside other members of the family since they announced they want to step back as senior royals. And everyone will be watching the body language. When they got engaged, there was a sense this was a couple excited about what they could achieve together. A few days later, they carried out their first walkabout, but the scrutiny has proved too much and palace life too stifling, leaving the Queen with no option but to agree they can step away at the end of this month. In just over two years, they have fulfilled every aspect of royal life. Today is expected to be the last of those official duties. In the end, their life together had to come first. For all of us, all we want to do is be able to carry out um, the right engagements, carry out our work and try and encourage others and the younger generation to be able to see the, the world in the, in the correct sense rather than um, perhaps being dis having a, a distorted view. So, you know, the fact, that I, the fact that I fell in love with Meghan so incredibly quickly was a, was a sort of confirmation to me that, that everything, every, all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life. And the fact that she, I, I know the fact that she'll be really unbelievably good at the job part of it as well um, is obviously a huge, huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with, with everything else that comes with it. But um, mm -hmm. no, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a fantastic team. We know we are and, and we'll, we, we hope to, you know, over time, try and have as much impact for all the things that we care about as, as much as possible. And just like that, as quickly as the whirlwind romance had started back in July 2016, less than three years on, they were gone. The couple decided that they wanted to leave royal life behind and make a break for freedom, but the palace were not receptive. 
Prince Harry and his wife Meghan considered the extreme measure of breaking royal protocol to contact the Queen as tensions grew in the royal family. They just family. want to get this resolved. Ultimately, this is a, a very sad internal yeah. family dispute and, and they just want to resolve it as a family. Despite the infamous crisis meeting to decide their future on January the 13th, the couple announced by March the 31st, 2020, that they were officially leaving the royal family would no longer use their titles and would become financially independent. It's definitely sad for the team at Buckingham Palace. They have a, they have a superb team there who've been fiercely loyal to them. I think the assumption would have been that there would have been possibly a core um, number of staff who would have been retained to run some kind of operation here for them. They've decided against that. They're severing all ties. It's a really strong signal that they are off on their own now in America and Canada. Prince Harry's biggest fear before leaving the royal family was history repeating itself, with his wife facing the intense scrutiny once faced by his late mother, Princess Diana. Yeah. Republicans say they can't simply pick and choose which perks of the palace they enjoy. You know, if they want to live privately, then they need to renounce their titles, abandon all claims to all public uh, funding and go and do their own thing. And had they done that, I'd be standing here cheering them on and saying, well done you, but they have not done that. They still want to uh, cling on to uh, the purse strings of the British taxpayer and they still want to have that status that we have given them. On their new website, the Duke and Duchess published what was effectively a manifesto of how they're going to deal with the media in future. And part of it was an attack on this and specifically British media and royal correspondents for their monopoly on royal coverage and essentially accusing the media of making private profit from their very public lives. They talk specifically about the Royal Rota, where British media cover royal events to be distributed around the world. Obviously claims they feel they've been hounded by the media, etc. But in reality, they've had, there's been nothing like that. Um, Oh, come Royal, on, you would say that. No, the Royal Rota system works, I think it's given them an awful lot of works for a... It's been going since the 1950s. And one must remember that this is an unelected institution that relies upon media, publicity, the public support for its life's blood. All the way through this relationship, we've seen examples of Harry trying to protect Meghan from the scrutiny. You have to remember, Meghan comes in the legacy of Princess Diana, and Harry saw the way his mother was treated by the press. And I think he's very keenly aware of how that happened and, and ensuring that that doesn't happen to Megan. The decision to move away from central London to go to Frogmore Cottage and move to Windsor is very much about protecting Megan. You know, they had just redecorated the place in Kensington. They had just done it up the way they wanted to when they announced they were actually decamping and moving to Windsor. Now, by moving to Windsor, Harry and Megan are hoping to preserve some semblance of normalcy for themselves and for their child. Even if you look at the birth of the new baby, whereas Kate Middleton was trotted out in hosiery and full makeup just hours after delivering her babies, Megan said from the beginning, I won't be doing that. They didn't even announce she was in labor until after the baby was safely born. All the way through the birth, even in the last weeks of her pregnancy, Megan was not seen. And all the way through her birth, Megan has maintained a determination, along with Harry, to keep certain things private, to keep protective their family. And they are not following the royal script. They are consistently deviating from what's been done before. And some people think it's admirable and some people think it's not. But ultimately, Megan and Harry are doing things their own way. I don't read anything. Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> much safer that way. Um, but equally, I, that's just my own personal preference because I think positive or negative, it can all sort to just feel like noise to a certain extent these days. Um, and so as opposed to getting muddled with that, to focus on the real cause. So for me, I think the idea of making the word feminism trendy, I, that doesn't make any sense to me personally, right? This is something that is going to be part of the conversation forever and you know for me it's a it's a tricky one because i'm not part of any of that and again like, as, as adam would know i don't look at you it you never look at say twitter no <laughs> sorry no um you know and i and for me that is my personal preference right prince harry may not have gotten stellar grades in high school something his critics will not let him forget but he is certainly smart 
smart enough to understand that a life as a working royal was not for him. And so he and Meghan moved on to a new life, which has been great for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, and for Harry especially. It's not about emotion. There are all kinds of emotions. It's about creating this future. And I certainly think that they will be squashing quite hard any suggestions of arguments or news stories saying about rifts or discussions. We don't know what's really gone on, but certainly the royal family want very much to give a united front, and that's, their, that's quite difficult at the moment. When he and Meghan first announced their intention to step back from royal life, some of Harry's critics were openly expecting and, in some cases, probably hoping he would fail. But to think that a supposedly pampered prince couldn't adjust to life outside palace walls was underestimating Harry's will, his brains, his desire, and his vision as a father and a husband. For the Duke and Duchess to forsake Britain and relinquish their royal duties, even for part of the year, will be a jolt to one of the nation's most immutable institutions. Well, I think, I think this royal family is going to have a great future. I think they'll sort this out today some way and uh, move on. I mean, if Harry goes or stays, uh, the royal family will stay, and I think the Queen will sort it out today. Yes, I think it will be sorted out today and quickly, and I think that this could actually work as a blueprint for minor royals. This is what European royals do, the siblings of the monarchs in Europe. They tend to have full-time careers or even live abroad. So it can actually work, but it, and I think it actually could be a positive future. And very briefly, there's been lots of discussion about diversity in the royal family. What does this do to that, depending on what's decided later? Well, Harry and Meghan, particularly Meghan, obviously they win over a, a very important grouping that the royal family don't always win over, young and diverse. And there has been a lot of sexist and racist criticism of Meghan. And, you know, she obviously feels to a large degree as if she's been chased out. So really, there have to be a united front and a big question about winning over multicultural Britain and multicultural the world. It continues the convention defying ways of Prince Harry, who enthralled millions of Britons and angered some others when he and Meghan, an American actress with a biracial background, decided to marry. It's a shame that that is the climate in this world to focus that much on that or that that would be discriminatory in that sense. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, I'm really just proud of who I am and where I come from. And we have never put any focus on that. We've just mm -hmm. focused on who we are as a couple. And so when you take all those extra layers away and all of that noise, um, I think it makes it really easy to just enjoy being together and mm. tune all the rest of that out. Do you know, if you look back for the last 10 years, so many things happened that we didn't expect. And difference is always challenging, but it can be great. On March the 7th at 8 p.m., CBS aired the landmark interview, led by TV legend Oprah Winfrey. The two-hour interview has caused an incredible fallout, the magnitude of which still cannot be fully understood. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist, and did huge damage to Harry's relationship with his father and with, with William. Harry also accused his father of cutting him off financially, which we now know actually wasn't true. We now know several things that were said in that interview were not true. They are in control, they release the images, they choose who comes and talks to them. I mean, that's a relationship that works in Hollywood, that's a relationship that works with celebrities. It's a great open question whether it's a relationship that can work with a senior active member of the British royal family. I think the relationship has got worse and worse, not least because of his relationship and now his marriage to Meghan Markle. I think he, ever since he set eyes on Meghan and fell in love with Meghan, he feared the day when he might lose her, and he believes that the media may play a part in his losing her. It was the interview that some within Buckingham Palace must have feared. But Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's discussion with Oprah was more revealing, explosive, and potentially damaging to the royal family than many could have imagined. 
It has been widely commented upon that Harry and Meghan kind of rushed into things. You know, they, they, they'd only been dating a short time, and then they went to the Invictus Games, and they announced an engagement, and now they have a baby. They haven't been, you know, sitting around. I think from Meghan and Harry's side, they knew quite early on that this was it. However, there's been a lot written about the fact that when Harry's friends and even perhaps his own brother uh, cautioned him, that perhaps things were moving too fast with an American who was unfamiliar with the royal demands and perhaps the royal system. Harry did not react well to that, and by all accounts, all reports, was furious with anyone who dared to question Meghan or her suitability or whether or not Harry was in fact sure. And Harry has cut people out of his life, according to the reports, based on the fact that they weren't welcoming and accepting of Meghan. Harry has been faultlessly loyal to Meghan from the beginning. In fact, when Meghan and Harry were first just dating, he issued kind of an unprecedented love decree to the press saying, I'm dating her, she's important to me, and basically back off. It was unprecedented. I mean, for him to go out public to the press and, and defend her, it goes to show even from the beginning how protective Harry is of her. Allegations of racism within the family itself and Meghan's admission that she felt suicidal during her pregnancy have been splashed across newspapers in the United Kingdom. Throughout their two-hour TV special, Harry and Meghan spoke with eye-opening candour, delivering accusations and rebukes that outweighed even Princess Diana's landmark interview more than two decades earlier. Prince Harry's relationship with the media went bad and has got progressively worse ever since uh, his mother died. He believes uh, deeply and profoundly that the media contributed to his mother's untimely death. So ever since her death, he has tried to find an accommodation, and that accommodation has been his acceptance that the intense interest in him could be used by him to throw uh, focus on issues that he is passionate about. If the Sussexes choose to make Canada their permanent home, whether for all or part of the year, that will throw up some challenges for the Canadian authorities, not least the vexed but as yet unanswered question of who would pay for the family's security. And despite arriving here at such a crossroads in their lives, everyone else's seems to have gone on as if they weren't here. And when it comes to raising children, that's exactly the point. I really think, you know, we're probably one of the best places in Canada, if not North America, to raise a family. Our residents are also really respectful, so we respect their privacy. And that's been a part of the theme since they came here on Christmas vacation. For a royal family steeped in tradition, there will be plenty more challenges on the path ahead. Harry and Meghan can only hope that the thaw in relations starts here. Harry claimed that when they left the UK for Canada, Prince Charles stopped returning his calls, leaving them feeling they were on their own. I think it's probably very difficult being the second son because you don't really have a defined role. You're just the, the joker in the pack. The, the, the attention is very much focused on the eldest child, as it was with William. I mean, Diana made a very conscious effort not to allow that to happen, but of course it did. Harry became important by, you know, being this big character, being this brave boy. So I think it is, it does, it does affect these kids. I mean, when you look at Princess Margaret, she never found the happiness she should have done. She was always completely in the shadow of her elder sister because her elder sister was queen. Megan, can you tell us what it's like becoming a new mum and tell us a little bit about baby Sussex as we're calling it? <laughs> um, it's magic. It's pretty amazing. And I mean, I have the two best guys in the world, so I'm really happy. Tell us a little bit about um, your son. What's, what's he like? Is he, is he sleeping well, good baby? Yes, he has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... Mm, he gets that from. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he's been, he's just been the dream, so it's been a special couple days. Who does he take after? Does he look back anyone? I'm still trying to figure that out. You know, everyone says that babies change so much over two weeks. We're basically sort of monitoring how the, uh, how the changing process happens over this next month, really. <laughs> but he's changed, his looks are changing every single day, yeah. so who knows? And how do you find parenting generally? What's it? Is it still a special moment? Yeah, it's great. I mean, parenting is amazing. It's, it's only been, what, two and a half days, three days? Yeah. Um, but we're just, we're just so thrilled to have, have our own little bundle of joy 
um, and be able to spend some precious times with him as he slowly, slowly starts to grow up. <laughs> and uh, I hear you're going to we're off to see two special people in a minute. Yes. Um, the Queen and, and the Duke. Yes, and we just bumped into the Duke as we were walking by, which was so nice. So um, it'll be a nice moment to introduce the baby to more family, and my mom's with us as well. So it's uh, it's been a really here we go. Nice, thank you. Thank very you very all very so much. much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you everybody for all the well wishes and the kindness. Mm. It's it just means so much. Thanks for the support. Thank you. Thank you. Behind the tall walls of Windsor Castle is where fewer than 25 guests were invited to witness the newest royal baptism. Those invited taken discreetly to the tiny private chapel. Outside though, the streets were thronging with people. Those hoping to catch a glimpse of the royal christening though, were left disappointed. We do pay for the royal family, including uh, Meghan and Harry. And I think that they could have given us a little, you know, um, a little something. I think it should be public, you know, it always has been, why, why change it? It's their decision, it's their family, um, it's not as if they're direct uh, in line. And this royal watcher says the public may have to get used to this royal couple's desire for privacy. Well, it seems to be the case that Harry has decided he wants his little boy to have more of a private life. He feels he's a long way from the throne and wants to enjoy some type of privacy. But it could be a problem because no matter what you do, he is growing up in a royal goldfish bowl. He has got two of the most famous parents in the world. Today's christening is a very different royal event, part of the continuing desire by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to raise their son Archie out of the spotlight. And they're a couple determined to do things their own way. According to Harry, the royal family completely cut him off financially around the first quarter of 2020, when they decided to become independent from the royal family. This left him concerned for his safety and the safety of his family. He said that he now is living off his inheritance from his mother. The most complicated of all the issues raised by the couple's decision to step down is their protection, specifically what form it will take, who will provide it and who will pay for it. Prince Charles has agreed to keep funding the couple and their son from his own private income, but by stepping back, Harry and Meghan will now be able to work. There are still lots of details to work out, but Harry and Meghan will soon be embarking on a new life and a different kind of royalty. Meghan claimed that she experienced racism from certain undisclosed members of the royal family who questioned her about her son Archie's skin colour. They both suggested that someone in the family had made a racist remark about the colour of the baby's skin. And Harry talked about William being trapped in a lifestyle and, and from which he had been trapped himself and hadn't realised he was trapped until Meghan had had made it clear to him. You know, Megan herself has talked about the challenges of being biracial. She has said, you know, I wasn't black enough for the black roles, I wasn't white enough for the white roles, and I was in the middle as a mixed race woman. And her journey has been in part to find the strength and dignity and passion for that role and, and embodying a beautiful, strong mixed race woman and all of that means. You know, Megan is re-educating people. There's never been a mixed race royal baby as we have now. And this is an incredible thing. I remember I was at the royal wedding when uh, Meghan and Harry got married. I was in Windsor. And I remember there were a lot of women there who were black with little girls, with daughters, who were celebrating this special day. And people can't have any idea what a big deal this is for there to be a black princess, for there to be a mixed race princess, because we haven't had that before. And I think that just by virtue of the fact that Meghan is who she is, inspires people, inspires young girls inspires women and that's a beautiful thing the royal family cannot survive if it doesn't evolve and it, it, it reflect the world at large and to be entirely white it certainly does not do that so Megan is representing just by virtue of the fact that she's accomplished and beautiful and smart and talented and mixed race and it's a wonderful thing it's great for the royal family it's great for everyone else Oprah went on to clarify that the couple made it clear that it wasn't the Queen or Prince Philip that made these remarks. Either way, the palace released a statement addressing the alleged racism. The palace said recollections may vary, but the matters would be handled privately.
The big royal wedding that cost 40 million pounds and was watched by the world. Turns out, it was all a performance. The couple claimed that they tied the knot in a secret ceremony three days before the big event in their backyard. Perhaps most troubling of all were Megan's claims that she experienced real and frightening suicidal thoughts as a result of such intense tabloid scrutiny and isolation at the palace. Becoming a royal meant giving up a lot of personal luxuries and independence. Meghan also claimed that it was disparaging that the palace refused to correct false statements about her. There were rumours that Meghan was bullying some of the staff. Her method of working was not what they had been used to. Whether it was because she was American, whether it was because she was um, a, a movie star who treated people in a different way, it was not what had happened in the past within that royal household. And I think William, when he heard that some members of staff were being reduced to tears or not enjoying their working life, I think he got very angry and he confronted Harry and told him what was going on. And Harry, I think, was protective of Meghan. So that is where I think the seeds of it all, of, of a fracture in, in this bond that had been so close came from. Then, of course, Harry and Meghan left as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America, and then gave that devastating interview to Oprah Winfrey, in which Meghan said that Kate had made her cry just before her wedding over a bridesmaid's fitting, where there had been a rumor long before that Meghan had made Kate cry. So in this interview, she wanted to correct that story and make it clear that Kate had made her cry. They both suggested that someone in the family had made a racist remark about the color of the baby's skin, and Harry talked about William being trapped in a lifestyle and, and from which he had been trapped himself and hadn't realized he was trapped until Meghan had made it clear to him. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist, and did huge, huge damage to Harry's relationship with, with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex returned to the royal fold for the Queen's Jubilee celebrations, but their relegated seats were a telling sign of their change in status. Far across the aisle from the Prince of Wales, the Duchess of Cornwall and the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, Harry and Meghan sat in the second row behind the Wessex family and the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. So for the Platinum Jubilee, there'd been so much build up about Harry and Meghan's attendance at the celebrations? Would they steal all the limelight? Would there be some big family drama? There was so much kind of build up and tension around it all. So for Harry and Meghan's kind of big moment appearance during the celebrations, Meghan chose to wear a Dior couture outfit in a very muted greyish tone. So this kind of grey meets beige colour. Again, it was very subtle look. Lots of other members of the royal family were wearing very bright colours, so it really stood out in a way that she was wearing more of a neutral shade. I also thought it was very interesting that the whole outfit was created by Dior, a French fashion house, a favourite of Princess Margaret. I think it's quite an almost kind of rebellious choice, but also a very fashion forward one. And she looked beautiful, but I think it didn't kind of take away all the attention off the other members of the royal family, which was very clever. For a queen with such a deep faith, missing out on St Paul's was a disappointing, if necessary, decision. But she was watching. She was looking not just at the service, but at the future of the monarchy. Working royals filled the front row chairs, meaning there was no place there for Harry and Meghan in the prime positions. They no longer used their HRH styles and the event was their first public appearance alongside the Windsors since they stepped down as senior royals amid the Megxit storm. They did, however, make a solo procession, holding each other's hand, 
down the nave of St. Paul's Cathedral after the rest of the mass of more than 40 royals and before the future King Charles and the Cambridges. With little happening at grand choreographed rural occasions by chance, it appeared to be a recognition of Harry's place as sixth in line and a former spare to the air and of the way things used to be. Meghan, in an elegant dual trench coat and matching hat, smiled as she walked through the church, while Harry bit his lip at times, while also nodding greetings to members of the congregation. There was no obvious interaction shown on the television camera between Harry and his brother William, who have long faced a rift, nor the Duke and Charles, who has also had a troubled relationship, or between Meghan and Kate. When they were growing up, William and Harry's relationship was incredibly close. The two of them really needed one another. They had, a, a, you know, an unhappy home environment. They were, luckily they did have nannies and they were therefore kept away from quite a lot of the acrimony that was going on between their parents. But nonetheless, you know, children pick up on, on things. They're very sensitive. And it was also fortunate that they went away to boarding school because again, that removed them from most of what, of the nastiness that was going on. But it, they did rely on one another. They were very close. The, the two are very different characters, but they, they complement one another very well. And they've always had a great banter. They tease each other mercilessly, or used to. And then when their mother died, I think that brought them even closer together because they couldn't share with anyone else what they had experienced. It, it wasn't, you know, like the death of, a, of any other, any normal parent because in, with the death of a normal parent, you don't have the world grieving as well. It was almost as though their grief was being devalued by the grief of strangers. So I think it was a very difficult time for them. And, and during that, sort of the, the years after Diana's death, there was a bond which was closer, arguably, than, than most siblings. I think the time when that bond started to fracture a bit was when Harry probably came out of, the, uh, out of the army and started going into royal work. And I think there was a little bit of, the space was, was quite small within their charitable world for the two brothers together. And I think Harry slightly railed at the hierarchy. Here was his brother, you know, his mate, but who was slightly pulling rank at times because where you know because he was the senior senior member of the family so i think there were one or two little niggles going on there i suspect that when william married kate i mean harry adored kate and kate adored harry but i suspect that as with every family when one sibling marries their focus turns slightly onto their their new wife or husband um, and then their children. And uh, where previously their full focus had been on the sibling. So I think maybe, you know, there were rumblings, but Harry, you know, got on very well with them right up until I would say the time that he met Meghan. My husband and I believe it's critical that our recovery prioritizes the health, safety, and success of everyone. And particularly women who have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. With the surge in gender-based violence, the increased responsibility of unpaid care work and new obstacles that have reversed so much progress for women in the workplace, we're at an inflection point for gender equity. Women, and especially women of color, have seen a generation of economic gain wiped out. Since the pandemic began, nearly five and a half million women have lost work in the US, and 47 million more women around the world are expected to slip into extreme poverty. But if we work together to bring vaccines to every country and continent, insist that vaccines are equitably distributed and fairly priced, and ensure that governments around the world are donating their additional vaccines to countries in need, then we can begin to fully rebuild. Not only to restore us to where we were before, but to go further and rapidly advance the conditions, opportunity, and mobility for women everywhere. 
there's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. But even though I'd been on my show for, I guess, six years at that point, and working before that, I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture to that degree and, and lived relatively quiet life, even though I focused so much on my job. And um, so that was a really stark mm -hmm. difference out of the gate. But um, And I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that I made the choice to not read anything, positive or negative. It just didn't make sense. And instead, we focused all of our energies just on nurturing our relationship. On us. Yeah. On us. In the American imagination, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle made the ultimate trade, exchanging rainy London for sunny California and replacing stuffy Buckingham Palace for anything goes Hollywood. But according to historians and cultural scholars, the royal existence the Duke and Duchess sought to escape will follow the couple, and the royal family, in turn, is likely to be defined by their new life with the nexus of celebrity, entertainment, and activism. I don't read anything. Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> much safer that way. Um, but equally, I, that's just be my own personal preference because I think positive or negative, it can all sort to just feel like noise to a certain extent these days. Marry the prince, move into a palace. From the outside, Meghan Markle's life sounded like a fairy tale. That's why Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan of Sussex shocked their family, their country, and the whole world in January 2020 with their surprise announcement that they would step back from life as members of the royal family. Their decision led to months of speculation, gossip, and leaks that continue to this day.